Hi, this is Josh Blackman. I am the president of the Harlan Institute, and I am thrilled to present to you the 2020 Harlan Institute Consource Virtual Supreme Court Competition. Today we are arguing the case of Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. Today we have two students from Minnesota. We have Curtis Herbert and Hayat Muz, and they will be arguing on behalf of the petitioners. Counselor, you can begin whenever you are ready. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. The state of Montana initiated a program to fund private education open to the religious and the secular alike. Religious parents used it to send their children to religious schools. As a result of their choice, the program no longer exists. This constitutes a penalty based on religion because of an amendment that discriminates against religion. As this court's cases show from Sherbert versus Verner, Trinity Lutheran, and Homer, penalties based on religion, discrimination against religion, run afoul of the free exercise clause. Accordingly, this court should now reverse the Montana Supreme Court's ruling and restore the program that existed before. For members of the Constitution, we're well familiar with religion in the public square. Religion was seen as a crucial and indispensable part of American governance held a favored position in the minds of the framers, who hired chaplains to pray in Congress, declared holidays to give honor and thanks to God, prefaced official documents with appeals to divine authority, and instituted laws based on religious morality. The framers expected the government to endorse religion on a non-sectarian basis and to protect religious exercise from the tyranny of the state. This court's precedents follow the reasoning of the framers. Sherbert v. Werner explains that the penalties on religion are just as invalid as prohibitions on, on religious exercise. Trinity Lutheran tells us that state practices that discriminate based on religious status are one kind of such impermissible penalties. And this court's establishment clause precedent for Marsh v. Chambers to Zellman v. Sims Harris makes clear that the state may indirectly fund and promote religion. There is certainly play in the joints between the establishment and free exercise clauses. Montana is not obligated to fund religious education if it does not wish to. If Montana does not want to indirectly fund religious education, it is free not to establish a program at all. So Counselor, let, to... Counselor, if I could just interrupt you for a minute. Um, you describe this aid as indirect. How, how is it indirect if the state's providing this aid to the school? What's indirect about this aid? Well, the way the Montana program functioned before it was invalidated was the Montana state legislature instituted a law and they would give tax credits to people who donated to a charitable organization. The charitable organization would then turn around and dispense uh, scholarships, in this case, to low-income individuals, which is very a form of indirect aid that importantly rises, arises out of the choice of private individual third parties. And like the court said in Zellman versus Simmons Harris and a lot of its other establishment clause cases, uh, when indirect aid to religion comes about not as you know a program directly funding religion, but as a result of private choice by private individuals, then the program is much less constitutionally suspect than it otherwise might be. Yeah, but counselor, isn't it obvious Montana did this to get around their state constitution's no aid provision, that they had this sort of Rube Goldberg machine to try and bypass it? Isn't this really kind of almost pretextual that this is obviously trying to help religion, but they can't quite say it so explicitly? Well, in the context of pretext, I'm not sure about the, the degree of scrutiny this court is going to apply to Montana's reasons, but I, I'm, I'm still not quite sure about that because Montana at least in my view and in the view of, of petitioners, is simply seeking to promote uh, access to education uh, for low-income individuals and to better uh, the education of children in the state. Um, and as to whether or not that's a pretext, um, it depends how stringently this court is going to look at it. Um, and, and I just don't think that the court is going to apply some sort of strict scrutiny. Situation. Well, let's talk about the state constitutional provision for a minute. Um, do you think the Montana Supreme Court was required to do what they did under their state constitution? 
I think it was probably the best reading of the Montana state constitution, which prohibits direct and indirect aid. But regardless, we're not asking this court to overturn the judgment of a state Supreme Court on a matter of state constitutional law. Um, that's not what the court granted this case to do, and that's not what, what we're asking. What exactly are you asking this court to do then? We're asking this court to reverse the Montana Supreme Court and restore the scholarship program uh, to its status before it was invalidated. Well, but in order for us to do that, are you asking us to declare the Montana Constitution to be unconstitutional, Article 10? We are. You are. Um, Counselor, how many states have these sorts of no-aid provisions in their Constitution? It's a relatively large number, to my knowledge. It's well upwards of a dozen, and the courts, you know, address similar provisions. So, recently. are you saying all these are unconstitutional on their face? Not necessarily. The court would have to, to litigate that on a, on a case-by-case basis. Right, but let's just take the Montana one for a minute. Do you think the Montana one is unconstitutional on its face? Yes. In all regards? Well, at least as, as it pertains to its, its status-based discrimination against abortion. Okay, so what case tells us that the, um, that the no-aid provision is unconstitutional on its face? Well, there isn't a case that this court has with exactly, precisely identical facts saying that um, no aid clause is facially unconstitutional, but uh, Trinity Lutheran strongly supports that proposition, um, as this does this court's earlier free exercise uh, clause cases like Sherbert versus Penn. All right, well, can't the state of Montana use these sort of Blaine amendments to avoid establishment clauses almost like a like a prophylactic why can't a state voluntarily tie its hands to avoid any sort of entanglement with church and state why is that not permissible well absolutely the state can absolutely voluntarily tie its hands but that's just not what happened here right instead of tying its hands and having no program the state of montana had a program then the program was used by religious parents to send their children to religious schools and as soon as that happened Montana shut the program down. So it's one thing not to have a program. It's another thing to institute a program and then punish people for using that program by shutting the program down. Okay, I have a question on that. Um, so you've talked on this actually uh, a little bit in your brief, but you said that Montana, if they so choose, could just not have a program at all. That's just essentially what the Montana Supreme Court has done. They've struck down the entire program, so now no one gets a scholarship. So what, in your view, is the harm here? Well, the harm is the fact that the, the program is, is no longer available because uh, of a penalty based on religion. So, like I was you know, ex- talking, discussing earlier with Justice, Justice Blackman, um, there was a program, and then because the program was used in ways that Montana Supreme Court saw uh, to be improper, the program was struck down. Right? The Montana Supreme Court is penalizing petitioners for using the program to attend religious schools. And this court's addressed similar situations uh, in earlier cases, like uh, Palmer versus Thompson and Griffin versus County School Board. And what this court has said is that when you shut down an entire program or shut down an entire institution, um, if you're doing so based on some sort of animus or discriminatory intent, then it's constitutionally suspect. And we don't really have to look far for discriminatory intent. So the discriminatory intent is right there in the Montana State Constitution, which prohibits uh, aid to sectarian institutions, you know, not because of what they do, uh, but because of who they are, because they are controlled in part by religious institutions. Counselor, do you think that Trinity Lutheran represented a departure from the court's precedents, or maybe we should just read the case narrowly to be limited to playgrounds? Well, the problem with reading Trinity Lutheran narrowly is that there's really not a good way to do that. Um, the reading that respondents suggest is that we read Trinity Lutheran to prohibit status-based distinction from discrimination. Um, but that really isn't feasible because the Montana State Constitution also uh, is an example of a status-based discrimination, right? The Montana State Constitution, um, if it were to be a use-based distinction, it would say, uh, that, that, that we bar aid to uh, institutions who promote religion um, or who teach religious precepts in the classroom. 
But it doesn't say that. It says we bar aid to institutions that are controlled in part uh, or in full by religious sects or denominations. So that distinction really doesn't work. And maybe maybe we can limit Trinity Lutheran saying that, um, you know, the, the, the case is primarily about uh, a playground and public safety, which doesn't have any intrinsic religious value. Whereas um, in the in the Stillwater, the, the, the religious school, they acknowledge that religion is you know infused in every aspect of the curriculum. Maybe maybe that's another way we could distinguish it that that we're just talking about kids scraping their knees at playgrounds. Well, uh, two things in response to that. Firstly, um, the improved playground in Trinity Lutheran serves as an incentive for people to attend the school and become part of the, the school sort of pervasively sectarian uh, schooling, as, as, you, as you sort of put it. Um, and secondly, uh, the problem with that is that even if there was a sort of a use-based uh, objection to Montana's, uh, to, sorry, to uh, petitioners' attendance of religious schools, um, then the Montana State Constitution is still overgrown, right? It still discriminates on the basis of status. So e- even if we could draw some sort of public safety line under which uh, a different version of the Montana State Constitution would be permissible, this version of the Montana State Constitution is certainly not possible. Well, let, me, let me ask a follow-up. I mean, we've had these Blaine amendments in books for almost 100 years in some states. Um, states have come to rely on them. I mean, what you're what you're saying is these are now all facially invalid. I recognize there's got to be case-by-case litigation, but lots of states have built their um, have built their system of government on this understanding. Um, the stare decisis and standing by long-standing practice, the, the stare decisis perhaps counsel us in, in such a sweeping ruling to say that this is unconstitutional on its face is what I think what you're saying. Well, as to stare decisis, this court doesn't have any cases that come up here. We're not asking the court to overturn any cases. As to long-standing practice, um, anti-miscegenation laws were a long-standing practice. Um, segregation was a long-standing practice, and we, I don't mean to besmirch the good name of the Montana State Legislature by comparing them to segregationists and racists. But I just mean to illustrate uh, the point that if something is unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional. Um, and this court, while it recognizes the value of longstanding practice, hasn't let that stand in the way of doing justice under the Constitution. Okay. Now let's talk about history for a bit. Um, you know, we have... James Madison, right, who wrote his famous Memorial Remonstrance, which seems to cut against your your, your your theory of the case. Can you discuss Madison for a bit? Certainly. So Madison's Memorial and Remonstrance, I think, takes place in a different context. Um, it, it's, a, it's a remonstrance against direct state funding of churches and ministers. Um, of a certain uh, religious sect and denomination. Um, so the the practices that Madison rails against, I think, are very different uh, than the practices that are. But that wasn't w- wasn't Madison worried about using? <sighs> In Virginia, as I as you recall, people could elect how the money was being spent. Right, they could choose which house of worship they wanted to fund. Isn't that similar to the Montana program where the private choice, as you say, can, can uh, uh, direct money to this charity or that charity? I mean, isn't, isn't there a similarity between the Virginia policy Madison objected to and the policy we have in Montana today, or at least we had in Montana before this court ruling? Well, I would say it's perhaps not as similar as today, but in any event, um, in the larger picture, Madison is, is one framer. Um, this takes place in the context of a founding generation that was paying for ministers to deliver uh, prayers at the opening of Congress, was proclaiming national holidays, give thanks to God. Do you think Madison and, and maybe Jefferson were outliers at this time? Jefferson was certainly an outlier. Madison, to some extent, yes, but less so. So you think their views are, are, should not be given such weight when we're interpreting the First Amendment? Is that what you're sort of getting at? 
Not that they shouldn't be given weight, but that they should be considered in a larger context of the moment. So you'd favor looking to Washington and others, and perhaps more so than Madison and Jefferson? Yes, to a certain extent. Okay. Council, you have about 30 seconds left. Do you want to wrap up your opening statement, please? Certainly. Montana is not obligated to fund religious education. It doesn't want to. Uh, it's free to establish a program. It's free to not establish a program. Um, it's free to increase funding to secular schools, uh, to pay public teachers more, to incentivize and subsidize private tutoring programs, and to do any number of things to benefit the citizens of Montana. But it may not shut down a program because of the discriminatory no aid laws. If there are no further questions, I'll see you on time. Thank okay, you. thank you so much, Counselor. Okay, um, we will now move on to the uh, uh, the rebuttal round. And Hayat, the, the floor is yours. Can you hear us okay? Yep. Okay, great. You have five minutes. Begin whenever you're ready. Your honors may please accord. Respondents make several arguments as to why the Montana's constitutional amendment does not violate the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. They are all unveiling. Respondents time and time again point to the invalidation of the program as evidence that there is no free exercise claim violation. However, this argument misses the point. The injury to petitioners is not disparate treatment, but the fact that they are penalized for choosing to send their children to religious institutions. Penalizing everyone for petitioner's choice does not clear the violation. Again, as my co-counsel mentioned, we can look to cases where such as Palmer v. Thompson and Griffin v. County School Board, where we recognize that the reason for the invalidation is a huge is a huge factor in deciding whether or not it raises constitutional suspicion. Additionally, um, respondents go on to argue that Montana's constitutional amendment does not violate the free exercise clause of the First Amendment and attempt to draw this distinction between Trinity Lutheran and this case. However, they don't address that the ruling in Trinity Lutheran was about the unconstitutionality of discrimination on the basis of religion, which we see occurring in Trinity Lutheran as well as the case before us today. Well, but Counselor, Counselor, if I could just interrupt um, just, just for a minute. I'll ask you the same question I asked your co-counsel. Why can't we read Trinity Lutheran a little bit more narrowly and just say that case concern public safety and playground safety, um, whereas this case involves religious instruction? Why can't we draw that sort of line that when you're talking about public safety grants, you can't discriminate the basis of religious status, but... With education, you can, uh, and, and I think Lockheed Davy provides some support. Why, why can't we draw that line uh, from Trinity Lutheran? Well, two points to that, and on the first point about Trinity Lutheran, it's about the fact that the Trinity Lutheran program, the program ruled, ruled that the program was unconstitutional. And Trinity Lutheran that provided aid to these playgrounds would not be available, would not be, would not be constitutional under Montana's constitutional amendment. So due to the fact that Montana's constitutional amendment, regardless if it's a school, if it's a religious organization controlled in whole or in part by a church, regardless of even if they offer an entirely secular curriculum, they are still unable to receive status-based discrimination happening. And it's less about what the root school teaches and more about its status as a religious organization. And additionally, on the point about Locke, we can draw several distinctions between Locke in this case. And what respondents fail to recognize in Locke is that this court upheld Washington's decision to withhold money in large part because of the efforts Washington made to accommodate religion. Unlike in Montana, this court cited the fact that Washington's program allows scholarship money to be used at pervasive religious schools as a reason for its neutrality and inclusiveness. Montana's program, on the other hand, does not allow these scholarship money to be used at religious schools. Wait, wait hold so, on. The money cannot be used at religious schools that we just said? In Montana's program, scholarship money cannot be used in religious schools. Well, but what about the Stillwater School, where Espinosa wants to send her kid? Isn't that a religious school? Yes. But under Mont under the Big Sky Scholarship Program, it could be used, but under Montana's constitutional amendments, there cannot be a scholarship program. Well, no, I, I guess that, but aren't you asking to declare the Montana Constitution unconstitutional? Is that what, what your position is? Correct. So, but th this program then is like law. In that money can be used for religion, like that, that, that's a similarity, not a distinction from Locke to David. The distinction would be that in Locke, Washington made these efforts to accommodate religion. So Washington did allow 
scholarship money to be used at pervasively religious schools. It just wouldn't allow scholarship money to be used at certain institutions that offered clerical training, such as seminaries for priests. But couldn't the Montana program also be used for religious instruction? Or before, before the... Montana? Yeah. Montana, under Montana's constitutional amendment, scholarship programs such as this one cannot be no, used. No, I, I get that, but you're asking us to get rid of the... You're asking us to restore the policy and get rid of the Montana Constitution. All right, carry on. You have about a minute left. Yeah. And so additionally, that's the several distinctions. And due to the fact that we don't see this accommodation for religion being made that we saw in Locke, we can conclude that Montana's scholarship program, Montana's constitutional amendments would not be constitutional. Additionally, the third argument respondents make is that the state of Montana does not have to fund education. This is not petitioner's point of view. We're not asking for the state of Montana to fund education. Um, we state that Montana is not obligated to fund religious education if it does not wish to, but it cannot condition the availability of general funds on secular status. And we see this in Trinity Lutheran. So if Montana wishes to have no funding for private schools, it can have that. But what Montana Supreme Court did by embodying the entire program is institute a generally available fund and then shut it down as soon as it was used to fund religious schools. That is a clear penalty on religion. Same time, perfect timing. All right, thank you so much uh, to Curtis and, my, and Hayat. Uh, <clears throat> you did wonderful. Um, as you can tell, I'm a very uh, tough questioner. I ask lots of questions, and I try to push you, and I try to get you to take a position on an issue, and as soon as you take the position, I try and push you over the line. Right? Once, I, once you say, of course, then I try and say, well, what about this? What about this? Oh, what about this? And I try and knock you over. Um, so don't take my questions the wrong way. I'm trying to really see how well you know your positions, and you both did fantastic. And I appreciate that you were willing to um, accommodate this unique tournaments fashion where you didn't have anyone to re respond to, so you responded to a team in some other state you've never met before. Uh, but this worked well. Um, Sebastian, is there anything you'd like to add? No, this was a lot of fun. Fantastic crowd. Very good. Um, uh, Curtis Hayat, do you have any questions for us? No? No? All right. Well, then we will be in touch in the next week or so with scores. We're very happy to have you and hope you guys stay safe. I was actually supposed to be in Minneapolis yesterday. Um, I was supposed to speak at the University of Minnesota, Minnesota in, uh, in Minneapolis, uh, right, right by where you guys are. But unfortunately, I can't leave my house. So uh, I'm here instead. But I would love to have uh, had lunch with both of you. Maybe I'll, meet you some, uh, I, maybe I'll see you some other time. All right. Uh, I will end this recording, and uh, we will see you all soon. Thank you so much.